Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming back in from that lovely lunch. That was delightful. Uh, so Luik just covered my first two or three slides, so I can just skip right through these. <laughs> Uh, I am uh, recently retired, um, but I have an oceanographer emerita appointment at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I was there for close to four decades. Um, I am co-chair of the International Oceanographic Data and Information Exchange uh, Committee of IOC of UNESCO, IODE. And I'm also co-chair of one of the working groups, specifically the one for data and information management for the IIOE2 research program. So IIOE2, that's not my alarm already, is it? Uh, IIOE2 is an acronym I'm going to use a lot uh, in this talk, but if you forget what it stands for, it's down here on every slide, the second international Indian Ocean expedition. It's second because there was the first one in the 60s. Uh, so my co-authors on this talk, and I wanted to put their names very large so I didn't put them on the front slide, Tobias Spears uh, from Canada, Pauline Simpson, who's in the audience here, and Peter Pasirsons, who's sitting next to her, um, have really contributed to the work that you'll see represented here. And then uh, my other um, members of the working group, two for data and information management, the only one who's here is Roger Proctor, um, who's here this week. There. Uh, thank you. Uh, so... I'm going to start with some context of the IIOE2 program itself and the science to give you an idea um, of the scope uh, of this program and uh, everyone in this audience will understand why the data and information management efforts are going to be critical to the success of this program. Uh, but most of the talk I'm going to focus on the data and information uh, strategy that the working group is going to recommend to this group of scientists. So uh, there are six science themes. They start with human benefits and impacts. Uh, in this region, in the Indian Ocean Basin, this is really, really important. The countries that border the Indian Ocean um, all have a vested interest in understanding uh, their natural environment. They're, it's uh, critical to their cultural um, identity and also their economic success. Uh, but also then um, boundary current dynamics, monsoon variability, circulation and climate variability, extreme events like monsoons, but also tsunamis. Uh, and then the unique um, geoscience and ecological features. The Indian Ocean Basin is, is a fascinating place to do research. It, um, it's got a lot of things going on there that don't happen anywhere else on the planet. The IIOE2 program uh, in the science plan, which is available online, these slides will be available and in the speaker notes in the bottom, I've got the references for everything that's cited in this talk so that you can find these things. Um, the science plan describes a broad range, the full complement of, they're going to throw every sensor and instrument package known um, out there, so lots of different kinds of in situ observations remote sensing, and there'll also be a synthesis and modeling phase that'll be going on uh, iteratively throughout the program. It's a 10-year program at the moment, but we're partway through, and they're already talking about extending it. I think they wanted to tread lightly at first just to see how this played with the funding agencies, um, but they're, they're getting a lot of traction, and so uh, there are already plans for another 10 years for this program. Uh, so we've got um, existing arrays of floats, gliders, moorings, buoys that are already out there now and have been collecting um, data for uh, years, if not decades. But then there's also um, these go ship repeat hydrography tracks that are also planned already for the Indian Ocean Basin. So these cruises uh, will be um, applying for endorsement as official IIOE2 programs. And part of what that means is that they will be expected to comply with the data policy and the expectations of open data sharing for data from, I mean, the ghost ship uh, data from the repeat hydrography programs, they won't have a problem because that's already part of the expectation for those cruises. Um, just a little bit about the governance. Um, this program is sponsored by the Indian Ocean Global Ocean Observing System, IOGUS. Scientific Committee on Oceanic Research Score, and also IOC, uh, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. So those are the three main um, sponsors of this 
uh, research program, very high-level sponsors. There's a scientific steering committee. There are um, six or seven uh, of each science theme and working groups. There's a joint program office. Uh, one um, installation is at the IOC Perth program office in Australia, and then the other one is at the Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services, or INCOIS. Uh, there are regional and national coordination entities, some of which existed before the program, some of which have come to be because of the IIOE2 research effort. And then there's also a new regional coordination <coughs> unit that was created specifically to uh, support the data and information management needs of the uh, IIOE2 research program, and that's based at INQUIS in Hyderabad, India. So, the Working Group 2 for Data and Information Management for IIOE2, uh, we have no authority. Uh, we're an advisory body. Uh, our role is to um, advise the research, the IIOE2 research community on best practices for data and information management, um, to answer their questions and give them advice for how we think they should approach these things. Uh, there's a list um, that's up there of the activities that the working group um, was told were important or we suggested would be important to, uh, to address. Um, I need to make it very clear that the working group is not doing any of these things, they, uh, but we're advising on how these things should be done and making sure that we get the message across that it's essential, it will be critical to do these things if they have any hope of having a successful research program. So the rest of the talk, I'm going to give you some slides on details of all of these things. Uh, so that's a lot to accomplish, and of course there's no funding for any of this. Uh, but it's not, it's not hopeless. Um, when I first saw that list of activities, I, I panicked. Um, but, but then I calmed down because I remembered that for the ocean, for the marine community in particular, a lot of good work has already been done, and what we needed to do was figure out what existed that we could take advantage of and leverage for IIOE2 uh, and maybe modify in case there were specific needs of the program. So here's the basic idea. Starting from the bottom up, we've got lots of different uh, platforms that are going to be deployed, moorings, ships, floats, gliders, remote sensing, satellite um, data will be used for this, and then new instruments that will be invented during the course of the program as well. Um, that's nothing new. I mean, this is what a large coordinated research program looks like these days. But we've got the full complement of sensors from lots of countries. Those flags represent the countries that already know they have funded research programs from their national efforts uh, or promises of funding. Uh, so we're going to get all those countries to work together to get their data <laughs> and metadata in. Piece of cake. Uh, into um, the IIOE2 metadata portal. So that's a new thing that's been built uh, to try and unify all this information. And uh, for instance, if it doesn't, if the data don't come in with ISO 19115 metadata, that will be the job of the data portal. To, you know, the, the um, strategies that you've heard a lot about already yesterday and today about um, adhering to standards and uh, publishing out the data in, in ways that can make it more accessible, visible. So the data portal has been built. Uh, it was designed and built by people at Inquis in Hyderabad. Uh, it starts with a catalog of projects, metadata that's driving the whole thing, metadata, 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 projects, cruises, moorings, um, and then eventually the metadata for the data sets and the data themselves, or at least links, links to the data. One of the other activities is uh, that the IIOE2 scientists needed to think about what they were going to do for data dissemination and the long-term preservation of the data. Um, as I mentioned, there was an, a first uh, Indian Ocean expedition in the 60s, and it's quite difficult to find those data. You can find some of them in the OBIS um, systems for the biological data, but it's, it's quite difficult. There certainly is not a large collection of um, Indian Ocean Expedition 1 data, which is a real shame because it would be nice to be able to do the compare and contrast. Keep in mind, the 60s, uh, you know, we didn't have the technology that we have today. Uh, but it's, we want to make sure this one is different, that IIOE2 does make sure that the data will be available forever. Uh, so, the good news there is that we can very easily take advantage of the IODE 
network of National Oceanographic Data Centers. And additionally, a fairly recent addition is the associate data units that are part already, these already exist. They're highly trained, um, skilled data managers, information managers that um, already are, are funded to handle the data from their countries or maybe in the case of the associate data units uh, for a, a particular theme of data. A lot of the um, OBIS nodes have received uh, certification as associate data units, um, which means they're recognized officially as part of the IODE network of data centers. That, all of the work there, combined with the specific IIOE2 data and metadata portal at INCOIS, uh, is going to handle most of the data dissemination and then the long-term preservation. So the data will be mirrored at the data portal, so we'll have the data archived at these national data centers, but then also uh, a built-in backup copy uh, at the IIOE2 data portal. Generally, so this is the what we've proposed as the flow of data to the Scientific Steering Committee and also at two workshops that have been held uh, in the last couple of years uh, that people have agreed to, and it's been iterated, it's been modified from what I started with, but people have signed off on this already. Uh, the basic idea is the <coughs> starting with projects that are officially endorsed as part of IIOE2, will be uh, the metadata will go to the portal, the platform metadata, ships, moorings, uh, gliders, um, will go to the appropriate data center for that country or that type of data, uh, and then eventually the data set metadata and the data set packages uh, will also end up there. So again, leveraging this... Um, existing very extensive network of National Oceanographic Data Centers and associate data units that will be able to work with the researchers collecting the new data. In the case where there isn't an appropriate data center or perhaps it's a type of data that the existing data center can't handle at the moment, uh, the staff at Inquist have agreed to take that information directly from the original investigators, which was nice of them. Uh, the good news is that all of the nations that currently have funded programs or promise of funding are um, IOC member states that have National Oceanographic Data Centers. So, um, and, and what's nice is that um, there are some countries that want to become active that now see this as an opportunity to create a National Oceanographic Data Center. Um, so that was a nice side effect of this that I, I didn't see coming. Uh, so there'll be new uh, nodes in this distributed infrastructure that'll be available in the future. One of the other activities was to identify a set of core measurements, but not just a list of measurements and the definitions, but also the associated quality control, quality assurance, sampling and analytical protocols for these things right at the beginning of the program so that the data integration later on could be uh, easier. Uh, the good news there is I recommended that they not start with a blank piece of paper but leverage the work that's already been done with the essential variables EOVs, ECVs, and EBVs from the Global Ocean Observing System. They agreed with that. Um, some of them, especially the biological ones, still need a lot of work, so they might have to um, interact uh, with the goose community to modify things to suit their needs. But I considered it a really good sign that they didn't feel they needed to create their own names for things or start from, from a blank sheet. So that was really good news. The protocol documents will be deposited into um, something called Ocean Docs, and I'll have more on that in a bit. And all of this activity is coordinated through the science theme chairs and also the scientific steering committee. And the importance of that is that this is not the data and information management working group making all of this up. We're feeding this back to the science community through their science theme chairs and the scientific steering committee. So the, the message theoretically is getting through to the scientists that are out uh, doing the data acquisition. We're heavily leveraging the existing capabilities and services of the IODE, the um, International Oceanographic Data and Information Exchange Network. Uh, the NODCs, ADUs I've mentioned, the OBIS nodes for the biological species data, 
the associate information units is something new, and uh, many of those are marine libraries. Uh, so perhaps it's not data, it's, it's information and documents that people need help with best practices. So those exist as well as a new type of node in the IODE network. And then there's also some projects and activities that have delivered um, capabilities as well. And that's the ones I'll talk about next. One of the activities that was identified as being important um, was promoting ancillary information systems. So as um, I think it was Per Luigi or maybe Christian Munoz this morning in the talk mentioned that research programs spin up uh, and lots of really good information is collected and published and, it, and these days it's available online. Um, but when you try to find it five, 10, whatever years later, you get a 404 because that site has gone down. When the funding stops, there's not a way for that information to persist. And so instead of promoting the idea of IIOE2 building their own systems for keeping track of ancillary information, cruise reports, protocol documents, newsletters, that sort of thing that are generated during the course of this research program, I recommended that they make use of already existing systems, and thanks to IODE and a lot of work that's been done over the past few decades, those systems exist. In particular, it's Ocean Expert, Ocean Docs, Ocean Data Standards, and Ocean Best Practices. And I've got a slide or two on each of those. If you haven't heard of these, um, I recommend that you go to these sites and Google it. Ocean Expert is a registry of people. Uh, but it's also got their um, ORC IDs or their researcher IDs, their skill set, their contact information. Extremely useful database. Uh, and then IIOE2 can harvest information from that, so they don't have to enter that information and build that from scratch. They could uh, reflect it in a different way for their own purposes at their site, but that saves them a lot of time and effort, uh, which is key because there's no funding for this. Uh, Ocean Docs is a wonderful repository, and um, if you have questions about these things, I'm not the person to ask, but Pauline Simpson is the one who's been leading this effort over the years, and we're lucky enough to have her in the audience, and if you're interested in this, uh, she can talk to you about this. We went too fast. So this is uh, an open access repository of marine publications, Focus on Marine. Uh, it's a permanent, secure archive of documents. It's designed and maintained by people with library science training. So these are people who are professionally trained in this kind of work. Um, you're, there's the ability to have, um, and I'll show you a slide on this, to brand it as IIOE2, which is important to um, support that information for this research program. There are the classic export tools uh, for, uh, you know, EndNote, BibText, those sorts of things. It's harvested and indexed by all of the major search engines. And there are persistent identifiers, specifically um, digital object identifiers assigned to these documents if they don't already have them when they're deposited. So here's a um, screenshot of what Ocean Docs looks like, and I mentioned the fact that there's the ability to create a community. International um, Indian Ocean Expedition has created. There are already, the 74 means there are already 74 documents in there. So they are, not only did they agree with this recommendation, but they're already depositing things. Uh, within the community, the Ocean Docs has the ability to subset the information by type, which is also very useful to help you quickly find what you're looking for. It's a, essentially a way to filter it. And another filter is this idea of recent submission. So you've been going to the collection a lot. You can easily find what's new in there. Another project that came out of IODE, and also Pauline Simpson is um, the person that uh, I credit for putting a lot of effort into this. Um, it's similar to Ocean Docs, but when something gets elevated, um, and usually this is organic, it's that several communities have adopted this way of doing something. Uh, and it can be all the way from data management approaches to sampling and analytical protocols for different types of measurements. You can deposit that information, the document, um, into the Ocean Best Practices repository. Very similar uh, type of features and functionality to Ocean Docs. Um, yeah, that's probably all I need to say about that except for the fact that, um, and you saw this referenced in Christian's um, talk um, this morning, and then also uh, 
there's a talk tomorrow morning as well um, on the Ocean Best Practices system. So the IODE, Ocean Best Practices Repository, which existed for a while, is now part of this much larger system involving lots of different communities. And so this is where the real strength comes from. Um, there's a lot of activity around this recently infused from the Atlantos project, but being picked up by the Global Ocean Observing System. So we've got large communities now contributing to this. Um, so this repository solves some technical challenges that they had, and instead of building a whole new thing, those these communities said, "Yep, we're gonna we're gonna support this effort, and we're, we we are also going to choose this as the place to deposit our documents." And what that means now is that this is now becoming a really nice location to find all of this information that lots of communities have decided organically that are best practices, or at least better practices, that other people should be able to have access to. So capacity building was another very important activity for this program. The Indian Ocean includes um, African states uh, on the western side, and then um, uh, a lot, you know, Pakistan, India on the, on the eastern side, places that really, this is a very nice opportunity to focus some energy and hopefully some resources in building capacity in the region for data and information management expertise, but also um, sampling uh, and, and uh, oceanographic techniques. Uh, the really good news here is once again, IODE already has the Ocean Teacher Global Academy platform. And once again, this isn't my project, but Claudia Delgado, who's been doing all of the recording here, is the person who's heading up that program. and. This has an extensive online library of course modules that already exist. Um, there's video with these. The course module, the, the synopsis of the course is written out, usually in PDF documents, uh, along with quizzes that follow up to the end. You can download these and run them yourself. Um, but even better, uh, Ocean Teacher Global Academy, so these are all virtual, they're online, but Ocean Teacher Global Academy also has regional training centers in these locations. And the very good news there is that five of them are in the Indian Ocean Basin region. And so this gives us a really nice opportunity to leverage all of that work, the knowledge that's there, and these regional training centers, the buildings, the infrastructure that exists, to run courses to help countries in the area build their capacity to do this kind of research. Uh, so we've already done two. One was a generic course in data and information management, and the other one was more specific on ocean observing techniques. Um, and I'm hoping uh, there hasn't been as much uptake in this as I was expecting. I was hoping um, in particular that we'd see more activity from the African states, but these things take time, um, so I'm patient, and I'm hoping that they'll... Um, <laughs> take advantage of this incredible opportunity. So these are uh, these courses are online. It's um, openly available, open access to these things. Again, if you haven't heard of this, uh, I would encourage you to check that out. Um, uh oh, I just went there. No, I don't. How do I use this machine? Stop. Uh, I think this is my last slide. So when you put all this together. What this looks like is so going again from the bottom up, and you can't see it because I did something silly. Uh, here's the IIOE2 new data that are going to come in and go through their local National Oceanographic Data Center or Associate Data Unit, including some OBIS nodes. The stuff in yellow are the new things that will be built or have been recently built specifically for IIOE2. These other things in sort of the greenish gray color down here are things that already exist. Um, and these are all things from the IODE uh, efforts over the last couple of decades. Um, all together, this comes into this ancillary information that the IIOE2 folks identified as being important to the success of their program. We don't have to have anything new for this. Just make sure the information flows to the repositories that already exist. Uh, All together, this stuff is going to go up and be reflected at the Indian Ocean Expedition 2 data and metadata portal. All of these things, this, is, this IODE Ocean Knowledge Platform is a project we've, again, Pauline Simpson, thank you, proposed years ago, but have not been able to get resourced. It, 
I'm still hopeful that maybe through IIOE2 or perhaps the Ocean Decade that we can find funds to make this a reality. So what this is, is um, in very briefly, is adding the semantic layer on top of these existing programs. Um, that would be a phenomenal addition to the really good content that's already there, but it would enable us to deliver much more effective services. And then all of this would be one of the possible contributors to um, the new IOC, Ocean Data and Information Sources System. We change the name about once a month. Uh, that IODE is um, in the process of designing, um, coming up with the architecture for all of IOC. So not just um, oceans, but uh well, not just IODE work, but also the other IOC programs like the Tsunami program or uh, Ocean Time series, um, all of those data coming in together. And that's all I have. And I left a few minutes for questions. Did I do that right? Yeah. Yes, we have a few minutes. Ah, good. Thank you very much. Yeah.